Well, welcome to our class on using uh, meters and, and different testers. Um, I guess the, the first thing uh, we want to uh, go through is this board. This board sort of represents everything you're going to have in, in your household, um, from a fuse breaker uh, panel uh, to some sort of motors, whether it's an exhaust fan, which this happens to be, or a ceiling fan. Motors are motors, it doesn't matter. Um, lighting doorbell system, uh, automatic lock, more light bulbs, uh, three-way switching in this case, uh, GFIs, outlets. So it, it represents just about anything you're going to find in your house. The only thing missing here is an intercom system, which that's a different class. <laughs> All right. Uh, what kind of test instruments are most common out there? Um, we have numerous different types. Um, here we have what's known as a clamp meter. Uh, it's also a voltage meter, uh, but the clamp is designed specifically to measure amperage, not voltage. Okay, You're going to have to know the difference between voltage, amperage, watts, things like that, in order to make use of some of these pieces of equipment. Um, a sophisticated volt ohm meter, multimeter, true RMS, very inexpensive digital multimeter. Difference being this is like $20, this is like $200. Um, a solenoid tester, and we'll get into their uses, okay. This is what most apprentice electricians will carry along with a voltmeter, of course, but they do have their specific uses and it's sort of explained in some of the documents you have there. A circuit finder. So if you don't know what breaker or fuse is controlling your circuit, this will track the circuit. This is just an adapter for use of, of the uh, tracker. So you could uh, clip it to wires or you could screw it into the, into the light bulb socket if you're testing lights, okay? Obviously this is, you know, made by the factory. If you just want to test the light bulb, this is two pieces, you know? Just a simple adapter and a screw-in plug adapter does the same thing. And then we have the non-contact uh, testers. All right, we, you don't have to be touching the wires in order to measure the voltage. Whereas with most meters and the solenoid tester, you're gonna have to plug it into the socket or touch the wires with the leads. This will at least this won't tell you what voltage you have, but it'll tell you whether the circuit's live or not, just by its beeping. All right. Let's turn on our house here. And we should be live. All right. So we're live right now. <clears throat> One thing I, I will um, mention even before we get into uh, the rest of the class, if you're going to be testing dimmers and somebody calls you up and says, my dimmer isn't working. Uh, I was on a job a couple months ago and they not only did they want to replace switches with dimmers, but they said they had two dimmers that weren't working. So sure enough, I turned the dimmer on, the bulb flashes once and didn't work. I figure I had blown the bulb out because something was wrong with the dimmer. And I take the wall plate off and I'm starting to remove the dimmer. And I went, wait a second. They had two sconces over the fireplace. I took the bulb out. It was an LED and right on the bulb it says non-dimmable. All right. So first thing to check before you start even ripping things apart is make sure on the new bulbs that on the bulb 
and on the package, it'll say dimmable. If it does not say dimmable on the bulb or package, it's not. Okay? Quick question. Is dimmable with like old style dimmers from like 10, 15 years ago? Good question. Most of the makers now are making dimmers that are CFL compact fluorescent and LED compatible. All right? Most of the dimmers we sold for the last 20 years work with L our LEDs, the ones we've been selling. Okay. It's possible it could work. I say possible. I know our the ones we sell and are selling used to sell that weren't compatible did work with the new LEDs, but that doesn't mean that some other makers are out there. I mean, there's all sorts of people making LEDs now, and I can't guarantee it. Yeah, the only thing I can say is try. You know, if it works, good. If it doesn't, you'll know you'll have to replace that dimmer with one that is LED compatible. Uh, you'll also notice on those kind of dimmers that it may be a 600 watt um, incandescent dimmer, but they probably limit it to 150 or 300 watt LED. The reason for that is, even though the LEDs use much less electricity, putting out 60 watts of light, but only using nine, there's capacitors in here. And when you turn them on for a second, it acts as a 60 watt bulb because that capacitor has to charge up in order to light the LEDs. That's why they down rate them because of that startup. Okay, so you're going to run 600 watt incandescent or 150 or 300 watt LED. 300 watt LED, that's a lot of 9 watt LEDs. Okay, so it's, it's compatible. Right, that is correct. That's actual wattage of the LED compared to actual wattage of the incandescent. So 150 watt LED, right. And again, CFLs, if the package doesn't say dimmable, which this one doesn't, it's not. Don't try and dim them, okay? one of two things would happen. You're either going to burn out your dimmer or you're going to burn out the bulb. They're not compatible. And what's happening with the LEDs, even if the dimmer is non-compatible, again, the electronics in the dimmer and the electronics in the LED are fighting each other, okay? Because the, the dimmer is sending pulses to the bulb and it's interfering with the electronics of a non-dimmable LED. That's why they sort of blink and or just won't work. All right, let's get with our uh, uses of some of these. A, a simple non-contact. There's br many brands out there on the market. We have four different ones here. And all it's doing is going to tell us if we have power. Okay, so again, without taking the outlets out of the circuit in order to get to the wires, I've just confirmed that those are hot. You have to put it into the hot side? Yeah. That's the neutral. It's not right. So it can even differentiate neutral and hot because it won't beep on the neutral side just the hot side now if i had something plugged in down here and there was current flowing through the neutral might it pick up the neutral it's possible it's possible and that brings us to one of the reasons for this type of tester all right as you read through some of the notes uh, that you have 
you'll notice that it mentions something about induced voltage, all right? For purposes of normal household wiring, uh, other than heavy duty motors, not like this, um, you're not usually going to get induced voltage. Induced voltage usually comes through capacitors or inductors that uh, are used on motors, air conditioning systems, furnaces, things of that nature that could throw a, a weird signal into your voltage system. What the solenoid tester does is tends to ignore any induced voltage that is there. In other words, it needs, it, it provides its own load and it has to have a pure voltage in order to run the solenoid in the solenoid tester. It's a mechanical thing. All right, there's a there's a, a magnetic plunger in here, and in order to overcome the spring tension in that magnetic contactor, it needs proper voltage, not an induced voltage. Induced voltage has really no power behind it. It's just a phantom signal that could be coming out of motors somewhere or other electronic equipment. All right, it, I'm not going to get into it that much. Even one of your articles will say um, that for purposes of most testers here for a household, you're not going to find induced voltage unless something's going seriously wrong. All right. So your resistance as measured and your voltage as measured um, by these instruments are going to be mainly correct. But that is the purpose of, of this type of, of just simple tester, the, the solenoid tester, is to get around that induced voltage. Same thing with what is known as a true RMS tester. Uh, RMS, what does that root mean? Square, all right? And I'm not going to get into the, the math that goes along with it. Uh, you've got a sampling of some of the math in your handouts. Um, Whereas this is just a very simple tester. It's not a true RMS tester. But for our purposes, and believe me, I measure things all over the store, and I just use one of the simple ones. I don't, unless I'm running and testing capacitors and motors, I don't need to get into, you know, the... Specifically kind of motors or things which have voltage. Yeah, right. Yeah, three-phase equipment um, specifically and especially around motors, okay, is where you, you need a lot of that kind of accurate testing. So we already know that we're live here. And we should be able to say that both of these are live. So we've already done, you know, fairly good testing. Now let's say we want to track. We're going to work on a circuit. We don't know what breaker is what. You know, I would say probably 98% of the places I go into to do work on electric, nothing is properly labeled. I mean, maybe two out of a hundred because people, even if it was properly labeled to begin with, in over 20 or 30 years, they've done work. And, and nothing, wires get shifted around, circuits get added. Um, it's just, it's a fact. So if you're going to work on a circuit, you definitely want to turn it off to start with, all right? Obviously, you may have to turn it back on to test the voltage, so on and so forth. Uh, but if you're, you know, replacing switches, replacing outlets, putting in new light fixtures, uh, and you know which circuit to turn off, turn them off. It's just a safety thing. I know a lot of us do it live. Sometimes we have to, especially for testing. But if you touch the wrong thing, you're going to get shocked and, and or blow up your pieces of equipment. I've seen 120 volt cut a screwdriver in half. So it's 
120. That's correct. I've seen it cut a screwdriver in half. It was just melted right through it. Done. So you can imagine what it can do to you if it can if it can cut a screwdriver in half. A standard voltage, you know, in a light circuit, it can hurt you. Especially if you have something wrong with your heart or you're you're wearing a pacemaker. And definitely stay away from it. All right, let's say we wanted to track a circuit. We can install this in the circuit. We should be on. Hmm. Not on. That's strange. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't know why it's not working. Let's try over here. All right. All right. It's telling you something right off the bat. Number one, it's live, and if you can see the two orange lights, and each one of these comes with usually an instruction sheet on it, or in some cases, uh, it's printed right on the testers, okay, what lights do what. The two orange just happen to say that that circuit's wired properly. It's not backwards, it's not whatever. In cases of, of GFIs, the new ones, not within I'll say four years, the new ones will, will not work if they're wired backwards. The old ones would, by the way. But the new ones will not work if they're wired backwards. So normally if you're testing GFIs, um, you don't have to worry. Now, this is also a tester in its own right. If I wanted to test the GFI to, to make sure it works at a certain threshold of voltage leakage, I just press the button and it just tested that GFI, turned it off. Mm -hmm. Correct. Now the GFI is back on. All right. So. Yeah. Mm hmm Because it's measuring to a, a certain um, external voltage leak. It's actually taking voltage from the hot and throwing it into the neutral as opposed, or throwing it into the ground as opposed to the neutral. Right. And again, this is, there's much more sophisticated GFI testers that you can actually tune to see what their, what their threshold is and test it at, at different thresholds. Uh, a lot of times on heavy circuits, uh, those will have a high threshold, but if you have a 30 amp GFI or whatever, or you're plugging motors and stuff into, as opposed to the household bathroom kitchen, which ha should have a very low threshold of leakage. All right. And again, the GFI is comparing the hot, the neutral, and if it sees that there's voltage going elsewhere than the neutral, then it pops. That's what it's designed to do, because mainly your shorting like that is going to be around water, and it's going to go to ground and, and pop. Uh, OK, so we have a, a tracker in there. Let's turn on our meter. You can hear it, okay, and see if we can find the breaker. Sometimes if it's well shielded, it won't read, all right, just like it is here. Now if I took off the cover, 
I could probably get a, a better reading. But since we're not getting a true signal, yeah, there we are. Okay. So, is it the right one? Well, turn it off. No signal. So we just found our breaker without having to go in here. If I didn't get a signal, okay, if there's two people, one watching this, and believe, uh, this is a little sophisticated, plug a lamp in <laughs> and have somebody go down to the breakers and turn the breakers that's, on the phone. That's the old-fashioned way. That's the old-fashioned way. It works. Yeah. You know, this is a one-person type test. If you had two people I there, you, yourself as the worker and the homeowner, eh, you just go and flip breakers. And when it goes off, it goes off. No big thing. All right, so we, we do have multiple things here. Let's make sure that we're still on the same circuits. Not only is it lighting up, but it's beeping. Okay. All right. Okay, so we're all on the same circuit. Now, in the case of the light bulb, again, this is my homemade tester. The reason I use the adapter is because these screw-ins are only two prong, okay, and this is a, a third prong. So your light circuits run on hot and neutral and no ground. So you're not going to get a ground in a light socket. So you just use the adapter. And we'll see if we get a signal through there. It's on a dimmer, so the dimmer may interfere with it. But it's still giving out a signal. Ah, different circuit. So my lights just happen to be on a different circuit than my outlets. That could happen in the same room, by the way. Just because you have one room with, with lights and, and outlets in it doesn't mean they're going to be on the same circuit. Especially in new houses, the lighting circuits are usually separate from your outlets. That's because lighting circuits generally take a lighter load than what you would be plugging into your outlets. So most of your lighting circuits will probably be 15 amp where your outlets, especially in a kitchen and a bathroom, very well could be uh, 20 amp breakers and or fuses. Simply because your refrigerator takes 12 amp, your microwave maybe 10 amp, dishwasher could be 13 or more, depending on how big the dishwasher is. So your circuits add up quite a bit um, with outlets. Uh, some of your big computer systems, um, if you, especially if you're a gamer and these things are running red hot, they're probably running near 15 amp on your big computers and that's just a little desktop thing. They can, they can run into high amperage. And your, your newer TVs, yeah, these you know 60 inch TVs that you're getting now even though they may be LED or plasma, they take a lot of power. You know, not as much as the old tubes, but they, these big TVs can take a lot of power when they're plugged in. Stereo system the same way. If you have a you know, 200 watt stereo system and you tend to crank it every once in a while, you know, it's, it's drawing a lot of power and then you start adding all this up. So usually you know, your lighting circuit 
is a little separated from your outlets in most new construction. All right, so we've, we've gone through two different test instruments already. Just the standard non-contact and then a, a simple tracker. And the simple tracker also tested the GFI circuits. I don't know of any um, devices yet that are testing arc fault circuits, if you know what those are. Um, <clears throat> they, are they are now being required in Chicago in um, bedrooms in new construction, all right? In old construction, if you are changing and or moving or adding out what's there required, um, arc fault. Arc fault outlets, arc fault breakers. <coughs> um, the purpose of those for being required in bedrooms, especially in the older houses, is most of your older buildings maybe only had one outlet in the bedroom. So you were running extension cords around the bed, and when you made up the bed, the wheels were running over the extension cords and causing shorts and fires. Hence the arc fault. It, the arc fault breakers and outlets can detect the electronic signal that is caused by shorting. It, it, it can detect that voltage variation that causes shorting. Is that not a full short? Is that a partial short? Yeah, right. So it can detect that little sparking before it gets serious. Okay, once, it's, it, once it starts getting serious, this is where the fires start where it's really arcing and, and starting to burn through the cords and hence the arc fault uh, outlets and breakers. The advantage of an arc fault breaker over an outlet is that it tests the whole circuit all the way back to the breaker box, not just what's plugged into it. Okay, so it can test the whole circuit where an arc fault outlet can only test from where it's plugged in to the device that's plugged into it whether there's extension cords on it or not. It can only go that far. The National Electric Code says they want these things everywhere. Chicago says, no, they're not needed everywhere, especially in new construction that requires that your outlets are no more than six feet apart in a room. So if you have a big room, you could have a dozen outlets in this room. All right, you don't need extension cords in new construction anymore because of the codes that, that say outlet here, outlet there, so on and so forth. Right, right. And the, and the thing is that it was more common in bedrooms where the rolling of the bed was really what was rolling over these extension cords every week when you're changing your linens. And it was just a pain, in, you know, it, it did start a lot of fires, hence the arc fault uh, outlets and breakers. Breakers came first, um, 2009, I believe, the breakers came into existence in Chicago, and only within the past year have we started seeing uh, arc fault outlets themselves. All right, so we've identified a live circuit. Um, there are testers that can uh, show us the circuitry for a dead circuit. Um, we don't have them. Uh, actually, we do. Uh, normally, they're used in telephone testing, uh, intercom testing to test the wires. They induce their own voltage into a dead circuit, and then you track it with, with a beeper. Transformer there or some other testing? No, I'm not with, with there's, there's testers that can test a dead circuit, all right? Um, they get very sophisticated very fast. Your simple ones range from about $50 to $120. The next step up is about 600 So they get very sophisticated very fast. Um, we do have the inexpensive ones. Uh, that could track, you know, this kind of wiring. Just about, there isn't really anything on the market that with 100% assurance can track conduit through the walls. 
because it's grounded. All right. Outside you can test, believe it or not. You can test for underground electric pipes. Why can't you in the house? Because there's no ground reference to, to go by. Because it is grounded, period. Uh, there's no refer ground reference. Whereas if you're testing outside, you're actually driving a ground rod in and then inducing a voltage into the underground pipe. And that can pick it up. It's got a ground reference. But inside, all your piping is grounded. And so it's, it's very unreliable trying to track uh, conduit through a wall. Um, there's only one or two companies that, that say they can do it. And I've talked to people, and I've used them. And it's tough. <laughs> it's really tough. You lose the signal a lot. Anyway, um, another inexpensive tester uh, that is used a lot, actually, is just a little continuity tester. This is not a voltage tester. It's known as a continuity tester. What it does is, is be able to tell you if you're wiring is good all right this is not used on a live circuit for testing voltage it's used to test wires basically from one end to the other or whatever or it's used to test fuses out of the circuit all right is this fuse good i don't know i can't see you know there's nothing to check how do i know it's good because my tester lights up all right, so it's a good fuse. It'll work on any wiring. High voltage, low voltage. All right, a screw-in fuse. All right. A lot of times, especially with these slow-blow fuses that have springs in them, you won't see a burn mark. All right, unless you know... I can tell by looking at the spring that this is a good fuse, and I know what a bad fuse looks like because the spring is all compressed at that point and it's pulled the contacts away. But it's tough, and again, good fuse. It's as simple as that. I mean, this is a $6 instrument, $5 instrument, and you can test every fuse in, in your house with it. You could also test circuit breakers with this. All right, how do I test a circuit breaker with this? I take it out, I remove the wiring, and then I can hook this to the circuit breaker and click it on and off, and it, it, it will be half a test. It will at least tell me, is, is there voltage passing through the circuit breaker? Is it capable of passing voltage? Now, that doesn't load test this. All right, it could still be a weak breaker, and on the simplest loads, it would turn itself off. But just by playing with the circuitry, you're going to know that. Can you test breakers with this? Sure. All right, how do we test for voltage with a meter or other things? Simple meters do many things. You can see all the, you know, around the dial here, all right? If, again, I wanted to test a fuse out of the circuit with a meter, uh, some of your paperwork says put it on continuity. Well, a lot of meters won't have continuity, especially as they start getting up into the, the upper range. But what they do have is resistance. All right. And how do I test my meter before I even go to test something else? Just put the leads together and my readings change. Okay. Just by testing the meter itself, I know now my meter's good. I've taken this out of the equation. So anytime you use a meter, you want to test the meter before you start plugging it in. Just make sure the battery's good. <laughs> so I know my meter's good. 
So all I have to do with the fuse is say, you know, the same with the little continuity tester, you know, there's my fuse is good because my, my readings change on the meter. Yeah, right. Right, it goes from one to basically, or a reading. Here I've got zero. Occasionally, some of the bigger fuses may test like one ohm or something like that. But usually it'll go from one to zero. And the same thing with, you know, this type of fuse. You just put one probe and put the other, and you can see it goes back down to zero and does the same thing as the continuity tester. If I want to measure voltage, and again, most meters, most meters will have AC and DC measurement. Most of your household is all AC. The only time you'll get into DC is usually in your um, intercom and or door lock circuitry. I just happen to have this one set at 24 volt DC, okay? Whereas, you know, this is running AC. And the way I've done that, you know, this is coming off a um, transformer that is AC, but I've modified the voltage with a diode. You made your own? Uh... Uh, my own DC circuitry. All right, it's very simple. I mean, we do that all the time in lock work and in intercom systems and things like that. That's what it's for, actually. The you know, only reason I did it here was to you know, differentiate AC and DC. Is that how most homes would have it implemented, too? Is uh, right on the panel there a little diode? Or was there, oh, I didn't even know that uh, there was both low-voltage AC and DC until, until then outside. Yeah, it, low um, low it could be at the panel. Or if it's a DC strike, it could be, you know, buried in the, in the jam right at the strike. I mean, this is a very small piece, you know, with, with a couple of wires but on it. Are, are all the buzzer things DC then? If you've no. Got a buzzer thing, so some, no, this is, this is AC. The, the one on the right, though, the door I mean, the door buzzers, No. They, uh, those can be AC as well. AC as well. The, the way you'll usually know whether it's an AC or DC is that a, an AC strike buzzes. When you can hear it. Okay. Whereas a DC strike, you'll go click, and you won't hear it. You'll just hear that little click. All right? If you hear that little click, you, you'll know that, that that's a DC strike. If they're buzzing, they're pretty much for sure. AC, AC right. It's at 60 hertz you know, AC that it is making it buzz. And the same thing here, that's, that's 60 cycles per second. All right, it's, it's breaking its own circuit. <clears throat> so that's the difference between AC and DC. And again, measuring DC, or AC rather, uh, you'll notice there's, you know, the, uh, again, it should be on your meter there, or on your literature. I can set this thing to, to DC or AC, all right? This meter happens to have only two ranges. Some of your more sophisticated meters might have maybe five ranges, or it'll be what is known as auto-ranging. You just put it on AC voltage, and it'll auto-range itself anywhere from zero to 2,000 volts. In this case, all I've done is set it to two, it has two ranges, 200 and 500. Well, we know that most of our voltage in the house is going to be 120 volt, 124, 120. It varies a little bit, but it's around 120. Okay, it can go down to 110 and as high as 130, but it should be in that range. If you're out of that range, there's a problem, and it's normally Commonwealth Edison. <coughs> and that becomes especially important when you're dealing with three-phase motors, but that's a different story. All right, so why don't we test our outlet?
119.56, whatever. So we know the voltage is proper. Same thing here. Same thing, same readings, because I'm getting the same voltage source. So I've, I've just tested my outlets with a meter. Yeah. No big thing. That's how you do it. On AC, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But they kind of, I think they're <coughs> kind of saying, oh, put the hot one into here. Is it just so you know which one's hot? No. No. It, AC, it doesn't matter. Okay. It, whether, now on DC, if I put my red on the negative on DC, what will happen is a negative will show up here on the, it will still read the voltage. It's reading it backwards, and it'll say, oh, no, this is a negative 12 volt. So I reverse my leads, make sure my red goes on the positive on a DC circuit, and go from there. You can see I have, you know, this one marked AC and DC. So let's switch to DC. And again, DC is, this is probably... The only place you're going to find DC in a, in a house is in lock work and in intercom systems. All right. Well, no, your intercom panel is AC, but if you have strikes, you can be running uh, DC voltage. Uh, the, the panel will still run that DC voltage. That's AC. Is kind of scratchy sounding. Uh, you think that's a power issue or just the button is working out? Um, so, you know, it could, you're, you know, you're like, like, it could be one of a couple things. Um, number one, these are not sophisticated speakers to begin with. All right. So they, they could be, and again, the buttons could be wearing out, the speakers could be wearing out, or one of the other things that most, they don't even tell you when the installation instructions, usually, but this transformer that would run, uh, let's say the AF1000 amplifier panel itself, should be six feet away from that panel. I'm not saying three feet and three feet, I'm saying lineal distance, six feet away. Why is that? Because as it stands right now, this transformer, not only is it broadcasting through the air, it's broadcasting through the wires. All right? It's, it's broadcasting a magnetic voltage straight out into the air right now. Okay? And it's also doing that through the wires. And the amplifier, some amplifier panels are sophisticated enough to pick up that interference the panel that runs the whole system no the, the main the main panel down in the basement that runs the whole system not your apartment station okay so if you hear weird sounds that's the first place to check is to make sure that this is six feet away from your amplifier panel on the intercom system. The other place to check is open up uh, the door panel itself where all the buttons are outside and make sure that, that the speaker wires are in a separate cable from the button wires. The button wires are an AC voltage direct. Your speaker wires will pick up that sound if they are in the same cable. All right, they will pick up the AC 60 hertz cycle uh, interference. So, and they do recommend that on the intercom system is that the speaker wires themselves are in a separate cable from all the button wires. So those are, those are two things you would look for immediately to see 
the, what's causing the scratching noise, those two things. And you can also check down where the amplifier panel is because you'll see where the two speaker wires are coming in. If they're all in one common cable, that's wrong. They should be in two separate cables. The speaker wire should have its own pair in a separate cable. It doesn't matter if they're next to each other. It should be a separate cable. They can be next to each other. Yeah. Right. Okay, how do I measure DC? Again, you have to know some of the circuitry that you're dealing with. So, on my DC circuit, uh, not only do I have, you know, millivoltage, but then I have 20 and 200 and, and 600 volts. <coughs> well, I know that my circuitry, because it would be labeled somewhere, and this just happens to be 24 volt DC, you'll see I'm getting two different voltages out of this transformer, by the way. It's a, it's a dual trans. I could have two separate transformers also hooked up like this. I just happen to be getting two different voltages out of this system. I happen to be getting 16 volt AC and 24 volt AC that I then convert to 24 volt DC to run a DC strike. Okay, and you notice, you can hear it, this is a DC strike. You hear just a little click. If this was an AC strike, it would be buzzing. And it's locked now. It's locked now. Okay. And I push the button. It's unlocked. So, can I test the the, a, the DC? All right, I've got it on 20. Let's put it to 200 because I know I've got 24 volt, not 20 volt that the, the, the meter's rated at. And I can then test my voltage, hopefully. <laughs> Should read, except we're not getting any reading. So it's, it'll pick it up, but it's not reading it properly because there's nothing going through. But when I have something going through, it'll it'll pick it up, so I can test it that way. As long as there's circuitry going through, and that'll test my DC. If I put the AC on there, it would just the meter would go nuts just because it's DC. Um, all right. And again, can I test the light bulb circuit with? With this setup, sure. You know, I just do the same two probes in this little tester, and I can test to make sure that there's power getting to a light. You know, if if you're testing a light, obviously, if the socket's burned out in a light fixture, I'm not going to get a test. Okay, so it, it's only half a test in a light fixture. If the socket of the light fixture is burned out and that's causing a problem. Obviously, I now have to take the fixture down and test the wiring to make sure I'm getting voltage to the light fixture itself. And that's identified that the light fixture is bad and there's still power at, at the, you know, in, in the ceiling for the light fixture. So you just have to know, you know, what you're testing. If I am testing a light fixture, that socket could be bad. So you have to go one step further and take the fixture out. Make sure you're getting the proper voltage at the fixture. Some of these, you know, doesn't necessarily have to look burned in order to be separated. These things happen to have rivets in them. If that rivet goes bad, it loses contact. It doesn't have to be burnt. It just has to be mechanically separated. And I've seen it because you're, remember, you're, screwing this in and out all the time, and those rivets can loosen up and or just fall out, 
and all of a sudden I've lost contact on the neutral, nothing's going to work. It doesn't have to be burnt. I mean, you, can t you can test the socket, obviously. Once you pull the fixture down, you know, you test the, the wire to, you know, the threads and test the other wire to the center of contact. And you can test that outlet. You know, the, you can test this socket. I've seen a lot of mechanical problems in sockets where those, those rivets just go bad over time. They could corrode because if it's an outdoor socket, they could just corrode and lose contact. Um, if you get enough corrosion in a circuit, it causes resistance and all of a sudden you lose power. So even corrosion on the wiring can cause a problem, especially if you're working outside, you're going to want to take a look at those wires and say, are they green? Well, oops, I just lost contact because of corrosion. You clean them off and everything's good and you don't have to replace the wiring. All right, and then replace the outlets or whatever that were, were corroded. Yeah, manager on line one, please. Uh, manager, line one. All right. Any uh, questions? Also, quick question. I'm, I'm working on a uh, project, a small project. It's uh, low voltage wire. I'm doing a um, replacing a doorbell with a wireless doorbell. However, I'm wiring it so that it continuously gets powered. It's requesting that yes. I were, in order for me to do that, it's requesting that I add a resistor to the transformer. How would I know what kind of resistor? It's going to tell you. It requires a minimum of 16 volts for that ring doorbell to work. Oh, you got a ring system. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out what kind of resistor I need. It should tell you in the, in the instructions what the, the rating of that resistor should be. Should say now is it a resistor or a diode? No, it, it doesn't require a diode. It wants a resistor to, to be plugged in. That I guess it's wired to the resistor and then to the transformer. Okay. Yeah. What that's doing is is making sure that the, the ring is getting a steady voltage. It, it would bleed off any strikes before it gets to the ring system. All right, that's what it's there for. The resistor's there that it, it, if there's a spike coming in that's over 16 volts, it'll bleed that off before it gets into the ring. But it should tell you, you know, what, what ohm rating that resistor should be. They should say right on the package. All right, or if, if they don't, you know, go into your computer system and or call up ring and say, what kind of resistor do I put in here? You know, I mean, resistors come in all different ohm ratings, you know, from, from one thousandth of an ohm to one thousand ohms. So you have to know what they want. Would you have to use that loop thing? Yeah. Um, well, some meters will be able to test up to 10 amp, but you have to drive it through the meter. And when I say that, you're going to have one of these probes on the hot, okay? It has to go through the meter. The meter. The meter is, that's why they only read it at 10 amps, okay? Most meters will be able to read 10 amps with this in series. Um, yeah, I'd have to, you know, read, yeah, in fact. Well, yeah, mm-hmm, in fact, 10 amp DC only, not AC. Clamp meter. clamp meter, right. So most will be able to run 10 amp DC, but it has to be, the meter has to be in series in the circuit, yeah. all right? Whereas when you're testing AC, you get into some of the clamp meters or the, what they call a finger meter, where they, which has two probes and, and it can just sort of surround the wire like that. 